presentation is going to look at the GI exemplar of pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas specifically caused by the release of enzymes into the tissues of the pancreas, which leads to necrosis and hemorrhaging. Pancreatitis can be seen as an acute or a chronic issue. Who's at risk for pancreatitis? We usually think about alcoholics, but remember, gallstones are also a high risk factor in developing pancreatitis. So we're actually going to list, if we think about it, in an order so we aren't judgmental of our patients, we can think of gallstones. Of course, your chronic alcoholics are at risk for pancreatitis as well. Anyone who's had abdominal surgery where there could have been trauma to the pancreas. Cigarette smoking, which is a low risk, but still a risk. Cystic fibrosis. Patients with severe peptic ulcer disease, any family history of pancreatitis, patients with hypercalcemia, high levels of parathyroid hormone in the blood, high triglycerides, any type of abdominal infections, anyone who's had trauma or injury to the abdomen, and patients with pancreatic cancer. Other risk factors can include patients on specific medications, including chronic corticosteroids, thiazide diuretics, and or oral contraceptives. These patients are going to present with a lot of pain, pain being warranted with the administration of anything orally into their mouth because we know that our pancreas starts to release enzymes whenever we start eating. They may be vomiting from the pain. Um, and we're actually going to divide them up into acute and chronic, so you can understand each of them as its own separate entity, because findings, pathophysiology, manifestations for both can vary. So let's look at acute pancreatitis first. So pathophysiology, the background behind it is an inflammatory disease that will cause self-destruction of the pancreas. It's common in middle adults, greater in males, and it is reversible. So you can have about a acute pancreatitis, we can treat it, and then you can never have effects of it again. So Manifestations will include a sudden onset. They're going to have epigastric abdominal pain. It may radiate to the back, so you may also be thinking there's some sort of renal component if they present with some sort of pain radiating to the back. Nausea, vomiting, fever. They're going to have some weight loss because they're going to be nauseous. They may have a rigid abdomen with hypoactive bowel sounds. They may be very distended. They're at high risk for left pleural effusions because there is inflammation on your pancreas, which is in the left side of your abdomen. If there is a mass noted, it will be palpable in the left lower quadrant. There could be a pseudocyst or an abscess form forming there. These patients are going to be hypotensive, tachycardic. They may have adventitious breath sounds. They may be labored with breathing. Why would we think these patients could have labored breathing? Think about if you have an inflammatory process that's pushing up on your diaphragm. What does that do? It kind of will decrease our deep breath abilities. The patients also may be cold and clammy. They possibly may have jaundice if there is any type of liver, gallstone, gallbladder involvement. And these patients will typically have a Turner sign or Cullen sign which in 24 to 48 hours, and we will look at what that looks like. In chronic pancreatitis, there's going to be chronic inflammation, fibrosis, and destruction of pancreatic tissue. 
There's typically can be found chronic obstruction of the common bile duct. If a patient gets acute pancreatitis several times from alcohol exposure and they don't stop the alcohol intake, it will turn into a chronic irreversible pancreatitis. It can also be seen in some autoimmune disorders, and there typically is a loss of pancreatic enzyme functioning as an entirety. These patients are going to present with left upper quadrant pain radiating to the back, very intense, also epigastric pain. They may appear anorexic with nausea, vomiting, and weight loss as well. They have increased constipation, um, increased flatulence. These patients are going to present with steatorrhea, which is the fat in the feces. If a diabetic, they may have increased symptoms of hyperglycemia, which includes our polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. When we're thinking about assessments of these patients, we want to remember abdominal assessments are very important. We want to find out where their pain is. Is it distended? Is it rigid? What do their bowel sounds sound like? Monitor closely their vital signs. So we're expecting adventitious breath sounds, inability to take good deep breaths. Their breathing is probably labored. Think about where the pancreas is in regards to the rest of the body. It's right underneath of your diaphragm. Cystic fibrosis, fibrosis patients have an increased risk of chronic pancreatitis because of their gene mutations, and they typically will not have acute bouts of it. It will just be a chronic issue for those patients specifically. In looking at the Turner sign and the Cullen sign, the Turner sign refers to bruising in the flank area between the last rib and the top of the hip. It's typically blue or gray in discoloration. In this particular picture, it looks more purplish. It is a sign of acute pancreatitis, um, and it takes about 24 to 48 hours to develop. So the patient may have complaints prior to this actually ever appearing. Diagnostically, for acute and chronic pancreatitis, again, we're going to divide it up into the two separate categories. So in acute pancreatitis, amylase and lipase are going to be increased. Your white blood cells are going to be increasing because it's going to be an inflammatory process. So you're going to want to run a CBC. In a CT scan, it's going to show if anything actually is blocked and or where the inflammation is occurring. And an MRI is going to actually give us a lot more details as to what specifically is happening. To manage these patients, they're probably going to have to be on an NG tube just as a temporary precaution. We're going to have to manage their pain, and typically you're going to give them morphine to help with that. And we're going to manage complications. So thinking about how we actually help. You want to help decrease their pain. So there's going to be a couple of things we're going to do for that, and we will talk about them on the following slides as well. When we're thinking about chronic pancreatitis, an ERCP is done to focus on any blockages, uh, and this is not going to be utilized in acute pancreatitis as it's more diagnostic. An MRI and CT scan, again, can show any blockaging or inflammatory processes. Ultrasound can actually show, can give us an idea of the size. They're going to have an abnormal glucose tolerance test. You're going to have that fecal fat in your stool samples. Amylase and lipase are only going to be increased if there's an exacerbation of the disease. Now remember, chronic pancreatitis patients, they're suffering with the pancreatitis all the time. So when they have these flares, that's when the amylase and lipase really start to become increased. There is surgical management of these patients. They can get a cholecystectomy if it has a gallbladder or gallstone involvement. A sphincterotomy is a procedure that's actually used to enlarge your pancreatic duct. So if you have any blockages in your pancreatic duct, 
the PJJ is when they actually go in and the duct is open um, to anastomose to the jejunum to relieve any obstructions. And then they can also have a partial pancreatectomy when part of the pancreas is actually removed and will actually help decrease the complaints of pain with these patients. In these pictures, you can actually see A is showing um, fistulas attached to the colon, B is showing pancreas where it is in regard to the stomach, and then that fistula where the jejunum is, and C is showing you where the PJJ, so where the pancreatic juice would actually be allowed to enter the jejunum through surgical intervention. Complications. With acute pancreatitis, you're going to see volume depletion, um, and then they would go into shock if it's severe enough. They may have some GU issues, such as acute tubular necrosis and or acute renal failure. They can have ARDS because of that left-sided inflammation and that inability to take in really good deep breaths. Hypovolemic shock, paralytic ileus. They can have DIC or left lung PEs. Again, remember, let's think about the anatomy of our patients and where the pancreas is in regards to the other organs in our body. We're going to give them supportive medications. We're going to give them morphine to help with the pain. Prophylactic antibiotics for severe pancreatitis to prevent any infection. Antacids, specifically H2 antagonists. Anticholinergics or antispasmodics. Antiemetics if they're complaining of um, vomiting and nausea. And steroids to help with the inflammatory process. With chronic, our complications are going to include malabsorption, malnutrition, and peptic ulcer disease, pseudocysts and abscesses may form, or there could be a stricture of your common bile duct present. They're going to receive a loss of enzyme production. Diabetes and pancreatic cancer. These patients, because of their chronic pain, have a high risk, higher risk for opioid addiction. Think about why that, when we're treating chronic pain, we can also uh, start to create more problems for these patients. With analgesics, we want to be sure that we are very cautious. Pancreatic enzyme supplements, which is pancreolipase. Now, we're going to know that pancreolipase is working because there's going to be a decrease in the steatorrhea. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be looking at their stools. H2 antagonists may be given to neutralize or decrease gastric secretions. Tagamet, ranitidine. PPIs can also be used as well, but H2 antagonists are going to be your go-to. And then insulin, we may need to manage blood glucose levels since they'll be elevated because the full functional abilities of the pancreas will be destroyed. So nutrition, think about why the patient needs to be NPO. The patients are NPO to give the pancreas and abdomen a rest. Every time we stick something in our mouth, we activate our pancreas. The enzymes start to work. We need to stop that. We're going to give them IV fluids to maintain fluid volume, keep their kidneys working and functioning appropriately, keeping them adequately hydrated. We can resume normal food and fluids when serum amylase norm levels are normal because at that point our pancreas enzymes can work to actually help with the digestion of food. We want to avoid alcohol and caffeine, provide any dietary supplements. We want to give high carb because that will give us high calorie, high protein, low fat. And that also, think about if we want our, our pancreas to actually be able to activate those enzymes fast, that's why we can start utilizing those high-carb meals. We may have to use an NG tube to decompress the stomach. We would be hooked to suction, uh, low intermittent wall suction, L-I-W-S, to decompress the stomach, decrease enzyme production of the pancreas. Assessment. Think about perfusion. 
What does the blood flow look like with the patients? What does their skin look like? What about vital signs? Respiratory. If they have adventitious breath sounds with this inflammatory process, what are we expecting to happen when they start getting better? Renal. They're going to be dehydrated. Uh, neurologic. Thinking about what that their neurologic baseline status is. Abdominal. Is their belly becoming less distended, less painful on assessment and mobility? Watch vital signs for changes. Think about daily weights. Maintain NPO status. Treat the pain as ordered. If the patient complains of pain and they say they're NPO and you walk in and there's a cup of water or a, someone came in with food and you see food, even if it's gum, food, candy, anything they stick in their mouth is going to activate their pancreas. We need to maintain bed rest in a quiet area. Encourage slight movement. They may need to lay on one side to decrease any discomfort. You're going to monitor their lab values, amylase and lipase. Are they coming down? Are they increasing? Stool charts. What does it look like? If we have chronic pancreatitis, we want to make sure that that pancreolipase is actually working and the steatorrhea is decreasing. NG2 possibly until the patient's on a diet. Small frequent meals to uh, reduce pancreatic enzymes. Discuss with patients the importance of decreasing risk factors for further issues. If it's high fat foods because of gallstones and gallbladder, we're going to think about decreasing that, giving them education. If it is from chronic alcoholism or drugs, we need to think about how getting our patients off of that can really help as well.